And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me. He fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us, he came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, showed him steadfast love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Join me as we pray. Father, I pray that by your Spirit, to the glory of your Son, Jesus, according to your Word, that you would open our eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe. Lord, I pray that you might awaken the hearts of men and, men and women here that do not know Jesus. And may he be honored. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You're up to speed now in Joseph's life. Don't you imagine that Joseph had to ask the question, is it any use being good? He was faithful to God. He had resisted that desperate housewife to try to get him. And look where it's landed in. Some of you know what this feels like. Just think about it. He is in, a, bring yourself into the story now. He is in a place of hopelessness. He's in a foreign land. His brothers hate him. His father thinks he's dead. The only people that he has any emotional connection with Potiphar, because Potiphar's benefiting so much from Joseph, the only people that he has any emotional connection with have thrown him in jail. There's nobody to turn to to get help. You read this story, and there's only one little thread of consolation. It's there in verse 21. There's one little thread of consolation that says, The Lord was with Joseph. You know, sometimes that's all you have to hold on to. Joseph's imprisonment, you know, his imprisonment is the exact opposite of what it should have been. He's been faithful to his master, Potiphar. He's been good to do everything that that man wanted him to do. He stayed away from his master's supercharged wife. He, he should have been rewarded, or, or at least thanked. But you know, for Joseph, it had to be maddeningly frustrating. He's carrying with him feeling the, feeling the injustice of having his master, Potiphar, put him in jail. I mean, you couldn't, it would be human nature to think, after all that I've done for you, or worse than that, you know, he had to feel a certain injustice from God. I mean, we, we've, we've all felt it before. You've probably even said it. 
what did I ever do to deserve this? Joseph had been serving God, and it was God who let him be put in prison. In fact, we'll see it later over in Psalm 105. Psalm 105 says that God sent him there. Was it any use then? Is it any use then even trying? Some of you know it. If you've, if you've sown the seeds of goodness, if you've sown the seeds of trying to do right, and you've reaped nothing but disappointment and pain, then you know a little bit about what Joseph is feeling, chapter 39. You know what, a little bit about what it means to be down in a dungeon. So, how then do we take what we know about Joseph, how then do we apply it, and how do we live in this unjust world, an unjust society, how do we live to fight another day? I'd like to suggest something to you this morning. I hope you'll get it from the passage. I want to suggest that our God is a good God, and a good God will get you through some really bad days. I hope you look at his life, Joseph's life, and think about God and how a good God takes you through really bad days. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's do what we've done before. Let's go back through the passage. I just read it. I want to just walk you through so you actually see some things for yourself in the Bible. Let's walk through the story. I'll amplify it just a little bit, and then maybe we'll make um, a couple of points of application after going through it. Join me now in the story in verse 13. <clears throat> Verse 13 picks up mid-stride. And as soon as she saw that he had left the garment in her hand and fled out of the house. The garment's in her hand because she got a hold of his collar and is pulling him down. And saying, lie with me. He does a little jujitsu, pulls out of there, drops that garment, runs out of the house. He does what he should have done. And she immediately, verse 14, she comes up with a plan. When he runs, she starts screaming, verse 14. She called to the men of her household because, remember, Joseph was in the house by himself with her. She screams out. They hear. They come running in, verse 14. Joseph is running out. She's screaming. They come running in. She's already planning into their heads the story she's getting ready to tell. She connects with him in verse 14. She says, see, look at verse 14. See, he is brought. She's talking about her husband now. She's going to throw him under the bus too. See, he's brought here among us. It's us and them. Us and them. He's brought here among us a Hebrew. See the distinction? He, she, he's brought a Hebrew and he's brought him here to laugh at us, to mock us. Not only that, verse 14, he came in here and he tried to violate me. When he, I saw him taking his cloak off, I screamed. Verse 15, and as soon as he heard me scream, this is the lie she's making up now. As soon as he heard me scream, he ran out of the house. He left his garment here. So as he's got the, the servants convinced, verse 16, she takes the garment and puts it over to the side. She needs that piece of evidence because Potiphar's coming home, her husband. So she has the garment to the side. Verse 17, he comes home after a hard day at work. Verse 17, <clears throat> she tells him, she's already practiced it one time. She knows it good now. She tells her husband the exact same story. And yet, here's what she's doing. Instead of being on defense, she attacks him. This is a good strategy. Verse 17, she jumps right on him. She said to him, verse 17, the Hebrew servant. Here's a little racism. The Hebrew slave that you brought, this is your fault. Now, this is what's going on here in verse 17. You brought him here. He came in here to mock me. He tried to violate me. This is your fault. Verse 18. I screamed out. I, as soon as I saw him taking his garment off, he was trying to undress. He took his garment off. I started screaming, and when I started screaming, he ran out of the house. Verse 19, you can feel his blood boiling. 
soon as he heard it. The text says, as his anger, what a poetic way of saying it, his anger was kindled. Get that fire rolling. Verse 20, he goes there. I can't believe he let him live. He had all the power in the world to kill him. Verse 20, some people say, well, Potiphar knows his wife and knows it's the kind of woman she is. She's probably lying, but because everybody saw this, he needs to go ahead and put him in jail. I don't know if that's true or not, but verse 20, he takes him to prison. You got to catch it there. It says it's the prison where the king's prisoners go. That's important. It's the foreshadowing for what's coming in, ver in chapter 40. And the text, tell text tells us in verse 21 that there he is in the prison. Read the story too if you see in Verse 21, 22, and 23, the word prison shows up about seven times. The author is saying he's in prison, he's in prison, he's in prison. And yet, verse 21 and verse 23, the Lord is with him. So what do we learn from this little story that we've gone through now? I think there are probably two primary lessons that are important to get that we can learn from, from Joseph's life. Here's the first one, number one. You and I must learn to trust the hidden hand of God. You, you and I, if we're believers, we've got to trust, just like, like the book of Esther where you don't actually see God's name, but you know He's working. We've got to trust the hidden hand of God. In the story, Potiphar's wife, in about verse 13 or so, she's going to start doing everything she can to paint Joseph in as bad a light as possible. As soon as he runs out of verse 13, she knows she's got to come up with a plan. Her plan then is to scream and then tell the other servants in verse 14. Notice the us and them in verse 14. She's already building a coalition. This Hebrew, the racism shows up. This Hebrew is here to mock us. As it turns racial, she she recites her story. She works through it once. She has the, the servants taken care of. Her husband shows up. And then notice verse 17, 18, and 19. She's going to tell her husband that it's his fault. And when I started screaming, he ran out. Now, now look at verse 17, 18, and 19. Notice how she get, takes her husband and she rubs his face into this lie that she's making up. Verse 17. She told him the same story, the Hebrew servant that you have brought among us. He came to mock me or laugh at me, verse 18. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment and he fled out of his house. Verse 19, he's bought it. An Egyptian general, a hardened man, a soldier, he owns Joseph. According to the law then, he had every right to dispose of him any way he wanted to. Well, I, I was reading this. Why didn't, why didn't he just kill him on the spot? He's killed men before for lesser things. He certainly had the right to do it. Not only that, drop down to verse 20. Notice where he doesn't just not kill him. Notice what he does with him in verse 20. It's important. I tried to give it to you a little taste of it. But you'll notice in verse, in verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. That word is used about seven times. The prison, the place where the king's prisoners, king's prisoners, why is that important? Well, you get to the next chapter, show up next Sunday, I'll tell you all about it. In chapter 40, he's now put in the king's prison. And there in the king's prison, there is someone called the cupbearer and another person called the baker. Those two guys are going to have dreams. And now one of those dreams is going to work out really well for the cupbearer. One of them is not going to work out at all. Baker, he doesn't make it through. He meets the cupbearer, the cupbearer, he tells the cupbearer, hey, when you get up out of here, you remember how good I was to you. Cupbearer quickly forgot until Pharaoh himself, the king in Egypt, has a dream. The cupbearer remembers, 
tells him about Joseph. You see, God put him in the prison to meet the cupbearer who would be before Pharaoh, who would call Joseph up to authority, who would then save all the grain, who would by his authority save all of God's people. All of it started in prison. Let me pause here and say in your life right now, there is a plan. You can't see it. You might not feel it. You might even be like Joseph in the middle of the prison. There is a plan. You and I as believers in a good and sovereign God who is in control of all things, you and I must learn to trust in big and small ways. You and I must learn to trust the hidden hand of God. You know, it's, uh, it's nice now and, then, now and then in the Bible you'll have a story and then you'll have the Bible itself give commentary to the story. The psalmist writes about this very story. In fact, I'd like to show it to you in your own Bible. If you have your Bible in front of you, you can just go right to the middle. Uh, that's where Psalm, the book of Psalms is. It's a big book. You won't miss it. It's not like Haggai. It's hard to find over there in the prophets. Right there in the middle of your Bible is the book of Psalms and Psalm 105. Let me show you the commentary in Psalm 105 on this story. The text uh, starts in about verse 16. Listen to how the psalmist tells us about this story. The psalmist writes in Psalm 105, verse 16, When he, that's God, when he summoned a famine on the land, and he broke the supply of bread, verse 17, he sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, God sent Joseph, who was sold as a slave, verse 18. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron, verse 19, until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. What do we find out about Joseph in Psalm 105? The Lord sent him, the Lord tested him. Okay, so scoop up out of 105, flip back to Genesis 39. Let's stay there. Let's stay Genesis 39 now. Take all that you learned from 105 back to Genesis 39. What do we learn about the, what do we learn about the hidden hand of God? I'll give you just a couple of things, big broad things. Here's the first one. God protects us. God protects us. Well, I mean, why didn't... Potiphar killed Joseph. He had every right to. He had the power to do it. Nobody would have even cared. Why didn't he kill Joseph? Why? Because God protected him. And God was not done with him. You may be wondering, how do you know? How can you know whether or not God is done with you? When God is done with you, we'll have a service for you. I have your friends here. How do you know God is not done with you? You're, you're here. God is still working in your life. He, God protects us. Let me give you a, a second thing we learn about the hidden hand of God. Here's the second thing. God sends us. God sends us. Just like we're doing with the families off to Bulgaria. God sends us. And I would just add a, put a comma there and I would say it like this. God sends us oftentimes where we don't want to be sent. I mean, Psalm 105 describes Joseph. Joseph is sent down to Egypt, but the way he's sent there is to prison. Joseph sent ahead. He sent, and it was painful. His, his neck was in iron. His feet were in fetters. He's frustrated. He's been betrayed, lied about, disappointed. You know, you can pause there, and there's some gospel truth here. Remember, Joseph is a foreshadowing of Jesus. And just as God sent Joseph to save the Israelites, God sent his son, his perfect son, Jesus, to take the place of sinners on the cross. So that on the cross, he died to purchase sinners. He died for people. In their place, God sent him. There's a picture here of the gospel. God sent Joseph. There's something else we can learn about the hidden hand of God. Here's the third thing 
we learn? And that is that God tests us. God tests us. If you've been alive for very long and walked with the Lord, you've walked through some things that have tested your faith. God refines us. God, God purifies us. The Lord says it in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10. The Lord says, Behold, I, I have refined you, but not like silver. I have, here's how God does it. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. You ever, you ever wonder why it's been so hard for you? You ever wonder why the Lord has taken you through all that you've been through? You ever wonder why the Lord has protected you and restored you and, and, and He's loved you and He's been patient with you? In Christ, He forgives you? Hebrews 12, 6 says that the Lord disciplines those that He loves. You see, His love is a disciplining love. His love is a refining love. His, his love is a pursuing love. His love is a calling love. Calling you to the cross of Christ to come and, and to fully and to finally surrender your life. Here's what I mean by that. God has been pursuing you. God is hemming you in to show you your need that your sin has separated you from God and you need Christ. And the promise of the New Testament is that God has sent Jesus and Jesus will take your sin and give you His righteousness so that when God looks at you, what He sees is the perfect Son of God. You need to learn to trust the hidden hand of God, that hidden hand of God that's bringing you home home into the arms of Jesus. That's the first point I'd like for you to consider about the life of Joseph. Here's the second point. I'll just make a two-point sermon. Here's the second point, number two. You and I need to learn that if God is with you, very little else matters. If God is with you, that's a big if, but if God is with you, very little else, all the things you think are so important, those things don't matter. Think about Joseph now. Go with me in your mind and heart to the story of Joseph. Go down into the story, sink down into the context, and think about where he is, and think about the beauty of verse 20 and 21. Genesis chapter 39, you see him in prison? Verse 20 says, Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison... I love verse 21. But the Lord was with him. In fact, if you keep pressing on that verse, verse 21, the Lord was with him and gave him steadfast love and gave him favor there. That word steadfast love, that is merciful love. Think about it. Think about it. Joseph had not only been, he had not only been lied about, Joseph had not only been wrongly accused, Joseph had not only been unjustly treated. It wasn't just that somebody said he did something that he didn't do. That's bad enough. The thing that he was accused of is the absolute opposite of what he actually did. And the level that he was treated, the, the unjust level, put in an unjust system under an undeserved punishment. Now, I've been thinking about this passage all week. I thought maybe I'd made a mistake breaking up chapter 39 and too many small, and I got to this section, I'm like, what do, I, what do I do with that? I've been rolling around in my head. And, you, you know, when you're a preacher and you're studying all week, you go to bed with it, you wake up with it in the morning, you ask people, hey, what do you think about this? Nobody ever cares when I'm asking them about it. So you just, it's all you think about. You get consumed by this, by this message. So I've been thinking about how do I apply, how do I apply, I mean, because it's really kind of a, it's a really bad situation. It's, it's left in verse, chapter 39, it's left without the hope yet. We don't know chapter 40 yet. So I've been thinking about how do we flourish in an unjust 
world. How do we flourish as believers in a world that does not consider us in the best light? How can you right now, probably all of you here would affirm you believe that God is with you. Okay, well, well how then do we affirm? How, how, do, how do we live right now in a way that demonstrates that God is in fact with you? The, the withness of God in your life. Well, I had this sermon rolling around in my head uh, yesterday morning. I got up to have my devotion. I typically use the McShane reading plan, takes you to the Bible uh, in a year, and I try to stay ahead a little bit. And uh, I, I landed in Psalm 37 yesterday morning. Now, most of you know Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, it'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, all around it, it's written in such a way that the psalmist is saying, I'm surrounded by enemies. And this is how I make it. And I'd like to close today's message and give you just four things I found in that psalm. Here's the first one. Psalm chapter 37, verse 3. Trust the Lord and do good. How are you going to take the next step tomorrow? Here's how. You're going to trust the Lord and do good. How are you going to live under the rubric that you're in and the, the, the struggle that you have? How are you going to do it? Here, trust the Lord. Trust that God is with you, that God loves you, that He's protecting you, that in Christ He has forgiven you, that He has surrounded you. Trust that He is in that. Joseph's in a prison and God is with him. Trust that in Christ, God will save you. When you, don't under, when you don't understand why the things are happening to you, why they're happening, what do you do? You trust the Lord and do. You do those things you know that are going to be honoring to God and good for the name of the Lord Jesus. Trust and do. Let me give you a second thing I think that you can do that's going to help you see and, 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 and live with the hidden hand of God. Here's the second one. It's Psalm 37, 4. You know this one. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. And so a lot of us like to focus on the end. Delight yourself in the Lord. I want the desires of my heart. Well, I'd like to take your attention. Let's turn it to the front end of that verse. Delight yourself in the Lord. What does it mean for you to delight yourself in the Lord? That means that you will find joy in the Lord, that you find joy in His kindness, that you, that you thank God for His mercy in your life, that you recognize His grace to you, that you love the forgiveness that you've been given, and that forgiveness gives you a heart of gratitude. That you can look around you and you see God's provision in your life all over the place, and you delight in that. To, to have a, what does it mean to delight? To have a happy and thankful view of Christ. And when you start delighting in the Lord, what happens is your heart starts to be transformed by the gospel, and then your desires are things that will honor God. He'll give you the desires of that heart. What's a, what's a third thing in the psalm? Psalm 37, verse 5. Psalm 37, verse 5 says this, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, He will act. Commit your way. That means how you live your life, the day-to-day -day activities, what you do, when nobody's looking, I'm asking you. I mean, isn't that what Christianity is about? You committing your way? This is you turning your, your, your heart and your mind and yielding that to the Lord Jesus. This is you turning from your sin, turning from all the junk that, that maybe you've been into, and, and turning that over to the Lord. This is you believing that the cross of Jesus is sufficient to save you, to, to restore you. So the three words so far, trust, delight, commit. I'll give you a, a fourth word. It's Psalm 37, verse 7. Psalm 37, verse 7. Be still 
Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Be still. Still so you can hear your own heartbeat. Be still. Still so you can think about where you've been in life. Be still. Still so you can think about where you're going. Be still and know that He is God. You wait on the Lord, and He is the one that's going to renew your strength. This is what I started with. This is what I'll end with. Our God is a good God, and our good God is going to get you through some really bad times. I want you to learn to trust. You're going to need to learn to trust the hidden hand of God, that God is with you. He is in it. He's moving. He has a plan. And the second thing I want you to learn, I want you to learn that if God is with you, there's very little else that matters in life. And the truth is, He is with you when you are in Jesus Christ. My greatest hope for you is not that you think this is a really good service today. My greatest hope is that you have Christ as Lord and He is with you in Jesus Christ. Will you join me as we pray together? With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment and prayer. There are some of you here that have yet to yield to the Lordship of Jesus. And we have something called an invitation here at Hickory Grove. It's just a song that's after the sermon that provides an opportunity for you to respond. <clears throat> There's several ways you can respond. You can come forward and have a pastor pray with you and pray over you. You can come forward and start the conversation with some of our trained leaders as to what it means to actually give your life to Jesus Christ or, or even to join Hickory Grove. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, when we sing, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, thank you for the grace you've shown us in Christ. We thank you for the rejoicing we can do in the Lord Jesus. And I pray that by your spirit, you will call, pray that by your spirit, you will call men and women to yourself. That above all, the name of Jesus will be lifted high. And for this, we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand, please? We'll sing together.